We welcome Ben tonight. Ben um, was so kind months and months ago when the pandemic first started and we were scrambling around trying to save ourselves. He emailed and said that they had started getting good at virtual tours of special collections and wouldn't we like one, which was so very kind of him and so heartening. And so now we are going to have our special tour. As most of you know, because you've been with us for years and years and years, we've been hosted in reality in special collections for a long, long time. And it's been a special part of our program. Uh, John Mustang started inviting us. It was probably in the early 2000s, 2005, somewhere in there. John now retired. Ben is now the rare books curator for Green well, it's Rare Books sits in Green Library, but is part of the Stanford University Libraries. And he asked me what I thought the group would like. And I said, well, we just had a wonderful talk on Viking shipbuilding and other good talks. And we're all, we're all starving for travel. <laughs> we're all hungry for travel. So he has put together books for us to look at um, based on virtual voyages. So this is a virtual tour of virtual voyages. So I think it's going to be an interesting and exciting evening. Ben, if you're ready to take over. Great, will do. Thanks very much, Evelyn. Let's see if share screen is working. So a few things up front. Um, last year, I thought we were getting pretty good at these virtual tours. By this year, I'm pretty convinced we're not very good at virtual tours at all. So. We're going to experiment a little bit with this particular trip to special collections. Um, and I will say that, you know, as soon as the campus starts opening up again, you're all welcome to come visit anytime, uh, individually or in groups, and we'll do something a little bit more put together for you next year. Um, as we get started uh, with this virtual visit, um, I wanted to do something similar to what we've done with you in physical visits in the past, which is provide a selection of items that you can browse in their entirety when I'm not talking or if you get bored with anything I'm saying along the way. So uh, with that in mind, I have given you a list of everything that we're gonna look at today. And if you're interested, uh, go ahead and bring that up now. It's just a Google Doc with all of the links. Um, what we'll be talking about are materials that have been fully digitized, uh, if not over the last year, over the last couple of years. Some of these might be familiar to you, but I hope that many of them are new. Uh, and I'm structuring today's tour around a, a book that was printed in 1486 that has been out on the, the researcher tables a fair bit over the last quarter. We have a graduate student working on depictions of travel uh, right now, uh, who's coming in on a regular basis. And this 1486 book that we're going to look at first and then use to sort of pin our uh, other materials to is, um, is a, a real spectacular piece of early printing. Um, so other piece of um, just information is I'm on headphones. If for any reason you can't hear me, um, maybe you could just use that hand raise function and I'll hopefully I'll see you over on the, the panelist side and be able to stop and adjust as we go. Okay, so HTTP bit.ly Serum Seminar 21 and uh, we'll go ahead and move into the, the, the route. So roughly, we're going to follow the route taken by Bernhard von Breidenbach in 1483 and 1484. He was a, a canon at Mainz Cathedral, uh, and he went with a, a small group of cohort, a small cohort, um, first to Venice, where they stopped off for three weeks, as you do, and then on through Venetian territories to Jerusalem uh, before returning via North Africa and Egypt and coming back across the Mediterranean. So sort of a big loop we're gonna do. We're gonna stop in three main places, uh, Venice, Jerusalem, and um, Alexandria and Cairo. Um, one of the things that makes this book spectacular, as we'll see in a moment, is um, 
the fact that he had an artist along with him, uh, Erhard Reuvig. Uh, and what makes the book particularly interesting are some very large um, depictions of cities that they went through along the way, including a five foot long uh, panorama of Venice. Uh, so it's a spectacular um, early printing for a travel book, uh, but also just a, a technical feat in general. Uh, there are a couple digitized copies I've put on our, our sheet, uh, so you can explore this book in more detail. Uh, and the Dusseldorf copy happens to have the large uh, panoramas uh, fully digitized. Not all of the digital copies have those available. I should also say that you can always call up our copy and come in and see it in person. It's a lot more fun to unfold the five feet worth of, um, worth of printing. So it's an unprepossessing book when you take a, a quick look at it, but you can just see um, along the corners uh, some things sticking out. And those are the things that we're particularly interested in here. Uh, so this has a, a very elaborate uh, frontispiece uh, with coats of arms and some, some pretty detailed um, decoration. And our copy happens to be hand decorated in certain areas as well, so that you can see that an early owner uh, paid to have this uh, rubric, uh, not rubricated, but have the initial decorated and then the foliate border added as well. But this is that view of Venice that I was talking about, which stretches a full five feet when you open it up. And it's uh, extraordinarily detailed. We'll move in just a little bit. If we take a, a quick look here, you can see the domes of um, San Marco. You can see the, the Campanile and the Doge's Palace here. And of course, all of the major landmarks are picked out to the left and right along the way. Our copy happens to um, have hand-painted initials throughout. Um, so I know from what John has told you in the past uh, that that you already know that these early printed books would have been sold without the decoration first and then had decoration added later. You can just see the little guide letter uh, M here, sitting in the, the loop of the M here, and then the, the elaborate red, blue, and white uh, initial added, and little um, spots of yellow picked out throughout the text to help with reading. This text also has um, depictions of the various people uh, that you might encounter on the trip that's going to be taken, as well as examples of their alphabet. So it really is a, a travel book, uh, trying to give you as much information as possible as you move uh, through the Mediterranean. Here's another one of our decorated initials. Uh, quite, quite, um, quite special when we open it up. Not many of our um, incunables have this much decoration in them. The last of the large fold-out uh, depictions, it centers on the city of Jerusalem, uh, which was the, the major goal, of course, for this particular journey. Uh, and then to the right and to the left, you have some of the other places that they visited, along with a ship in the lower corner here, uh, depicting their, their voyage as they come through. But again, all of the major Landmarks are, are picked out uh, and, and shown. So like I said, they, um, oh, um, let's see. So I'm gonna stop sharing for just a minute. Reshare with, um, my screen. So if you haven't been able to get to it, I'll make sure that, um, that you all have access to that full uh, link list. And then before we move on, I just wanted to do a, a quick tour of what we're going to be looking at. So I've picked out uh, a world map from the Parker collection at Corpus Christi College. This is in manuscript 66 at Corpus. It's a 12th century um, Mapa Mundi. And uh, wanted to just kind of guide you through the map that we're going to be following, the, the Breidenbach map in the 1480s, this in the, the 12th, uh, 12th century. This particular map is 
um, oriented towards paradise. So instead of having a north, south, east, west axis, uh, we've got paradise sitting up at the top of the map, which puts the British Isles and Ireland down in the bottom left-hand corner. You can move along to the entrance to the Mediterranean here, the, the Straits of Gibraltar. And so the map is in a rather unusual place, uh, but it puts Jerusalem and Bethlehem here in the center of the map itself. And we're going to start in Mainz here, uh, Magontia, on this particular map. And from Mainz, we're going to cross the Alps and head to Venice, uh, shown here as the Mare Venetum. And then across to Jerusalem before heading back to Egypt, uh, where we have Alexandria and Cairo uh, picked out. And so that's from a, a medieval map maker's point of view, we're heading, we're heading north-ish towards paradise, uh, but we're not gonna get all the way there, of course. Okay, so take us back into our PowerPoint. And like the travelers in 1483 and 1484, we're gonna stay here in Venice for just a little bit. And the first thing we're gonna do is take a look at um, a manuscript painting that was created for uh, a convent that is now somewhere underneath the Venice train station. So I know that you all have traveled regularly uh, and the train station in Venice is here. Our convent, later a church, was demolished and now sits underneath uh, that particular structure. And what we're going to look at are two pieces of manuscript painting by Cristoforo Cortese. Uh, one from early in his career, right around 1401, 1402, and one a little bit later, 1435, 1440. Some of you may have seen uh, these um, manuscripts uh, during the Burke exhibit, um, which was unfortunately cut short uh, by COVID early last year. So I thought we might dive into these a little bit more deeply together. And the first one we're going to look at is um, Christ enthroned with King David playing the psaltery. And the second one we're going to look at in some detail is uh, a depiction of the ascension. So I'll just back up here to this and stop sharing screen for just a moment. Reshare with my browser. And let's take a look together at Christ enthroned. So as we're looking at this particular manuscript painting, first thing to point out is that it is a large B and the two lobes of the B are inhabited by two different characters. Uh, this was produced in 1401-1402 in Venice, like I said. Uh, it's now pasted onto card. So uh, as you'll be able to see as we look through this, the gold is cracking, the paint was starting to come off, and at some earlier point in conservation, uh, before Bob and Kathy Burke bought it, uh, it had been pasted onto board to help shore up the various pigments. Uh, so we're not exactly sure what book this came from. It's likely from a Psalter, um, but without more information, it's a little hard to say. So in the upper half of the B, uh, we have Christ enthroned, uh, blessing and holding a book uh, open in his hand. And you can see just the level of gold leaf all around this particular illumination is incredible. Um, no expense was spared for this. In the bottom half of the B, we have King David seated on a throne and playing a psaltery. And interestingly, there's a Dominican nun kneeling at his side. Given that this piece dates to around 1401-1402 and the presence of the nun, uh, scholars have been able to suggest that it was commissioned by the nuns of the convent of Corpus Domini in Venice, which now sits under the train station. Uh, they had just been uh, rededicated in 1395 and had money available in the early 1400s to revamp 
all of their liturgical books. And Cortese was hired to uh, decorate those. And so this book is from that batch of books for that convent right around 1401, 1402. And there's a, a chalice and host sketched out within the gold leaf along the right-hand side, which um, strengthens that suggestion that it was produced for a religious house. Now in typical Cortese fashion, the borders are full of interesting characters. Here we have a hybrid character, um, bestial legs, human body, wings, uh, blowing a trumpet. And if we move up a little bit further, we have this spectacular multicolored bird capturing a, a gold uh, ball here. And one of the things that Bob Burke likes to point out is that in every Cortese, there's a, a nearly invisible rabbit hiding somewhere in the foliage. And in this particular piece, here is our rabbit. This piece also has a, a really spectacularly lifelike dragonfly added to it. So this bee would have probably started the, um, the first psalm, the Beatus Vir, uh, and was probably from a Psalter, could have been from an antiphonal, but we're not exactly sure. So that's the first of our Cortesis that we're gonna look at. There's a, a couple more pieces to this page uh, that are floating around out there, and we'll look at those in a minute. Um, the Burke piece has been cut down, but there are two more pieces of the decoration from this huge elaborate page uh, that are now at the Met and they've digitized those as well. So we'll take a look at those in a minute. But let's move over to uh, the other Cortese produced about 30 years later, maybe 35 years later. And this is a, a depiction of the Ascension uh, to decorate an introit for the Feast of Ascension. So this is a feast day uh, and this level of decoration is, is absolutely appropriate for such a high feast. Um, it decorates the introit, uh, and as I said before, produced in Venice, 1435-1440. So if we look at this decorated initial, uh, this is the V or U of uh, Viri, or Viri. Um, and the, the colors really stand out in this. It's in much better shape than the other Cortese piece in the Burke collection. In the bottom half of the initial, we have the Virgin and Apostles. And um, one thing to point out is that you see a little bit of light reflected on the halos here, but under candlelight, this really sparkles. And one of the things I'd like to do uh, when we get people back into the reading room is get a bunch of those uh, electric candles uh, and have all of our um, highly gilded pieces out so that you can get a real sense of the, the play of light on this. It's a little static within the, the digitized version. In the upper half, we have Christ ascending with two angels accompanying his ascent. And here you really get a sense of the, the quality of that blue, blue background. It's, it's so rich and the, the gold rays uh, here stand out. And again, with like the previous Cortese piece, uh, we have rich border. So here we have a, a guinea fowl in the bottom left, uh, a little more blue than most guinea fowl, but that's okay. In this corner, we have an angel, uh, a bearded face and an eagle uh, overlooking the, the border. As we move up here, we have an angel playing a portative organ uh, with really nice detail on that particular instrument. A little bit further up, uh, a saintly abbot holding what appears to be a crozier. You can just barely see it in white in this hand and resting his hand here on a, a gilded book. Uh, you can make out the pages if you zoom in closely. Uh, this has been identified as Saint Benedict by art historians. As I mentioned before, uh, every Cortese has a bunny uh, and here is the bunny for this particular Cortese uh, hiding almost the same color as the vellum he's painted on. And then as we move up, uh, we have a figure, St. Justina of Padua here. 
uh, she was a, a noble woman, and all of her accoutrement here help us understand that. So she's got a gilded crown on top, but particularly interesting for us, for medieval books, she's holding a, a, a book that has a girdle binding. So it has a loose strap of leather, a flap of leather, that can be held onto or even wrapped around a belt. Uh, so we've got a model of one of these uh, that we can show you next time you're in in person. Uh, but they're a fascinating um, and very functional bookbinding that let, lets you take your books with you. And even the plain little eye that starts the, uh, the rubric for this particular page is highly decorated as well. One of the things that strikes me as we look at this is that the, the decoration itself ascends from the, the bottom left all the way up to the right in the top. Uh, mirroring the ascension that's being depicted in the, the decorated initial as well. So next time you come see these in person, you'll be able to look at them in detail. Uh, but I hope that's a, a good little tour as we walk our way through uh, those two pieces. Heading back over to the PowerPoint now. So I mentioned that uh, the Met has two of the other pieces of the first Cortese that we looked at, and they happen to be two musicians. And you get a sense that this highly detailed sort of geometric decoration must have continued up the page in a very elaborate way, um, as you see uh, where these would have fit somewhere up above the B that we're looking at. You can explore those uh, in on your own, the, the links are in the sheet, and see if you can figure out where they actually would have gone. I'm not, not convinced of my placement yet. Our next Phoenician stop is going to be, um, we've done this one already. Uh, we're going to head up to uh, San Michele in Isola, or uh, San Michele in Murano. Um, this was uh, a fairly important library. And if you've read uh, Bound in Venice or some of the other books about Venetian book production, uh, you'll recognize this location as a place where the library stayed intact for a long time and kept some of the treasures of early Venetian printing. So there are um, fantastic examples uh, that come from this particular library. Stanford's very lucky in that we have a manuscript that was once held there. Uh, the library was uh, occasionally pilfered throughout the 19th and early 20th century, and books came on the market. Um, ours went through a couple of different um, owners, um, one of them, uh, Sir Thomas Phillips, uh, who you probably know was one of the major uh, manuscript collectors in England in the 19th century. He built up a collection so large that it took almost a century to sell it off at auction. So jumping out of this, we'll take a look at that piece in detail. And you can explore this uh, on your own as well. Um, we'll take a look at this Congregation of the Clergy of Venice. And a couple details to point out as we look through together. Uh, this really ugly binding uh, is just cardboard, and we've got some detail in here that tells us an old catalog record. But as we start looking over here, we start seeing things that are more interesting. So here we have uh, Phillips manuscript number 9971. And the fact that it came from an early Cochrane catalog. So we know that Phillips got it from Cochrane, another book dealer uh, who specialized in manuscripts in the uh, 19th century. And as we move in, um, we see that the binding that was on it was just extraordinarily cheap. It was a, a workaday binding. Um, and the distinction as we look at the book itself is pretty clear. Um, it looks like our manuscript 
was torn out of a, a group of other pages. And there are a couple of reasons we think that. First of all, we start at page 225. So somewhere there are 224 other pages to this manuscript. Um, and we know that uh, from the set that Cochrane had, a number wound up at Oxford and they all came from this part of uh, the Venetian uh, lagoon. Uh, so it's probable that there were a number of Venetian texts bound together. So one of the interesting things about this manuscript is that we've got dated years uh, as we go through. So we start in 1433, and these are the laws uh, for the clergy of Venice, and they were basically created as presentation copies uh, for um, folks high up in the, the hierarchy. And if we flip ahead just a few pages, you'll get a sense of what the manuscript looks like. It's a single column uh, throughout. And every now and then we get a mark like this, which is a scribal mark. And we know who the, the scribe was. That's Philip here. Um, and they sign off uh, on the sections that they're working on. So we can move ahead a couple more pages. Keep an eye out for more of those scribal marks. There's another. And here we have Antonius um, leaving his mark. And this continues throughout. So there, there's a wonderful set of names. We could go back and put together a network of both the people that were um, being written for and the people who were doing the writing, which is a particular fun thing, particularly fun thing for um, book historians uh, throughout. So I'll leave you to explore that one on your own. Um, again, fully digitized, easy to, um, to work with. And then we'll move back to the PowerPoint. One last piece of manuscript material from Venice before we move on is a uh, a manuscript that was once listed in our catalog as an unidentified history of Venice and the Crusades. And it's a bifolium, a very small fragment. And Paula Findlin has been teaching with this over the past few years. Um, many of you will know Paula from our uh, history department here at Stanford, a fantastic history of science uh, scholar. And she's been focusing on Venice recently. Um, so while we were getting ready to do her class this year. I did a little bit of research on this manuscript. And I thought we might just look at it in detail the way that we would have in the class together. Uh, so one of the first things that we do is just get a sense of the physical size of the piece. And I'm using my own hand uh, to show that. And then pointing out to the class the difference in color around the top and bottom. And uh, as we look in, inside, uh, we can see those lines at the top and bottom as well. Um, and what we had them conclude was that this was a, a binding at one point. So this particular piece of vellum was wrapped around boards and at some point formed part of the binding of another book, including things like a, a now scraped off um, um, pasted down sticker. And some of the things that we were pointing out as well were um, damage along the sides, but also places where it might have been sewed in. Next thing that we did with the students was transcribe this in detail. And we're using a, a tool here called From the Page, where we can put any of our digitized material in and then let the students or anybody in the public uh, transcribe along. So, um, basically, it's a, a simple image viewer with a text uh, block here that we, we had the students put in. So we transcribed all of the columns of this particular text so that we had a sense of what the text was. We were then able to identify the text as a, a fairly little-known chronicle of the history of Venice called the Chronicon Altenate because it, it focuses on a particular region of the Venetian Lagoon. Uh, of Altino. And then we gave the students the opportunity to read um, 
the full text alongside their transcription. So kind of a, a way of um, building out knowledge about our fragments as we're working through them. And I'd invite any of you to work with our fragments this way as well. I can certainly set you up with any of the tools you might need if, you, if you're interested. The final step with this, though, was to put it in context. So we have just a very small fragment at Stanford, and one of the things that we can do now is um, put this alongside other witnesses uh, for this text, and there are only three. Uh, one is held in the Vatican, and that's the one that we're going to look at, and two others are held in Venice uh, proper. So not a very widely circulated chronicle. So ours is actually um, kind of unique, and what we were able to do was match up our fragment with the text uh, in the Vatican copy uh, so we know exactly where we are in the text, what's missing, and get a real sense of how much was lost when, when this particular manuscript uh, was disbound and reused. Okay, so let's leave Venice behind and head on our way towards Jerusalem. But before we leave, we've got to do two things. Uh, we've got to pay for the trip, and we've got to ensure, basically ensure ourselves, um, because it's a dangerous trip in the Middle Ages. So the first thing that we'll take a quick look at, and you can explore this in more detail on your own, is a, a last will and testament written by um, Bernard Pader uh, before his departure for the Holy Land in 1108. So before he actually left for um, pilgrimage crusade, I'm not exactly sure what he was doing, to be honest. I should have double-checked that, uh, but we can confirm that. Um, but because he was embarking on this journey, the very first thing he needed to do was make a provision in case he didn't come back. Uh, so this particular will and testament leaves his land uh, and property uh, mostly to family members. In our sheet, um, I've given you a link to the full transcription as well. Professor Rowan Doran has had his students transcribe this so that you can pull up the image and read the transcription alongside and see exactly what Bernard was leaving. Uh, and Professor Doran did a little bit more research and some of the, the, one of the churches mentioned in this particular document still exists. We can find it in, on Google Maps and the other had been destroyed at some point uh, in probably the early modern period. Paying for a crusade was something else altogether. And here we have an English document from the 14th century, uh, which is uh, a receipt for the crusading tax. So as money was being raised um, to go into the, the coffers to support a crusade, uh, here we have a, a sealed document recording that and a particularly interesting and, and fairly readable hand. Um, I'm not sure if you're seeing my mouse or not, but if you are, I'm circling uh, the term for Hereford here, uh, so we can place this pretty carefully uh, into a single location. Uh, we also see uh, London down here and a few other place names that stand out as we, we look through. Uh, and Scotia, Anglia, etc. So a fun thing to look at just to, uh, to play, pick that place name as we go through. From Jerusalem, and unfortunately we don't have a whole lot from Jerusalem in the Middle Ages in our collections, so the move from there is from Jerusalem to Egypt. And here we have a, a quick look at um, Breidenbach's uh, text showing Egypt and the area that he moved into. Um, so Egypt here, Alexandria over here, and then up the Nile a little bit is Cairo. So one of the earliest pieces of um, North African material we have in the collection is this set of 6th and 7th century pilgrim flasks which were purchased um, a few years ago when John was um, John Mustaine was curator and they're a fantastic teaching set uh, so we can explore these in a little bit more detail I'm going to come back to them in just a minute um, but these were created for a shrine uh, that is located just south of Alexandria uh, and some of them have text on them uh, but they're now being used 
uh, by our history professors pretty heavily uh, when they're trying to give a sense of the material culture uh, that was happening in North Africa in the 6th and 7th century. I'll return to those in just a minute. Um, before we leave North Africa, I wanted to touch a little bit on Timothy Hopkins and our earliest papyri here in the Stanford collections. Uh, so Timothy Hopkins, as I'm sure you all know, um, was a, a close associate of the Stanford's, um, adopted into the Hopkins family, and played a large role in Stanford uh, development in the 1890s, early 1900s. I was on the board of trustees and that sort of thing, uh, but who was also very interested in Egyptian antiquities. I went to Egypt a few times and donated money to the Egypt Exploration Society. And in exchange for his donation, the Egypt Exploration Society sent him four pieces of papyri uh, for the Stanford collections. And so we know by 1915, they were here at Stanford. Uh, there's a, a bit of a, a gap in our knowledge of what happened to those pieces for a number of decades after that, though. Sometime by the 1940s and 1950s, no one knew where those papyri were anymore. And there are files in special collections that show people occasionally writing to ask if they can see those papyri uh, from Oxyrhynchus. Uh, and the librarians sort of sheepishly saying, uh, we don't think we have those, we don't know where they are. Uh, but in 1971, Isabel Rabachek found them in the Stanford Museum collection. I should say she found two of them and had them transferred over to Stanford Special Collections. So two of the, the four Hopkins papyri have been found in 1971 and came back to us. Two are still missing. Uh, so as you are moving about campus, if you ever see a piece of papyrus framed on somebody's wall, uh, give us a shout. They're a very interesting pair of papyri. One particularly is um, something that would be fantastic to find again for the collection. It's a small fragment of Homer's Iliad written on vellum in about the fifth century. Uh, so it would be um, a quest really to, to find this if you happen to be moving around places on campus that have, have those things. What we do have though is um, uh, Oxyrhynchus papyrus that Hopkins um, acquired. Uh, that was transferred to us in 1971. And it's large, it's a, a, a land deed uh, and a very fun piece to look through. So what, what I'll do now is just slip us out again to um, our live view. And we'll scroll down. First, taking a look at the flasks. And you can get a sense of the size of these. They're not terribly large, maybe eight centimeters uh, high, four centimeters across. And the level of detail that we have is pretty good for digitization. It's a little hard to see on the screen, uh, but there is text available uh, in some of the decoration on these. So you can test yourself, your paleographic skills uh, with those. And as the record here tells us, um, these would have been very typical pilgrimage flasks, souvenirs in a sense, of um, a trip to St. Saint Saint Menace's um, shrine in North Africa. Uh, so this is the sort of thing that Breidenbach and his group of travelers may have picked up on their way. These are particularly early, so sixth or seventh century, uh, but in remarkably good shape. And look a little bit closer here. You can just make out a figure stamped on the, the side. And finally, the fourth one. All stoppered, all for burning oil um, as we move through. And then if we move over to our papyri, you can take a look here. So this land lease, which looks fairly small as we look at it, as we zoom in, uh, is quite an extensive papyrus. And there are some ethical questions about the Egypt Exploration Society dispersing um, papyri like this in the early 1900s. 
uh, they sent hundreds of papyri, primarily to North American donors, I think in the hopes of raising interest in their society. Uh, and they only sent out things that had been published in their publication series. So the physical object um, may have been seen as a little less uh, important once it was published. Um, but I feel like it's, it's ethically incumbent upon us to find these, make them available to the world again, particularly given uh, some of the issues that have cropped up in recent years with uh, that collection at Oxford, um, with pieces being sold out, um, sold out of the collection uh, in unethical ways. So things to explore there. Quick check-in, we are at 7.45. Uh, so I'm going to wind down this quick tour, uh, but leave you some things to explore on your own. Uh, so I wanted to show you a few things before we end uh, that are available for you, even before we get you back into the reading room. One is an exhibit uh, for our ancient, medieval, and early modern manuscripts at Stanford. And that link gives you everything that we have uh, that's digitized at the moment. Uh, I've got a little too much furniture on my screen right now. Let's see. There we go. So you can do a search and see all 466 of our digitized medieval pieces uh, and scroll through there and enjoy. Um, they're there to be looked at and to be worked with and to be read. Uh, and so, I, like I said, if you happen to, to decide you want to do some transcription or play with these in other ways, just let me know and we'll get you set up. Uh, the Burke Collection on its own, uh, those beautiful manuscript cuttings are all available online as well. Uh, 41 miniatures and leaves, two complete manuscripts, and two soon to be three panel paintings uh, to explore. And finally, uh, one of John's real treasures uh, is an exhibit on beautiful printed books. So some of the um, early printed books that we have are available here as well. Uh, nicely laid out, and you can browse by date, uh, time, and year. And finally, like I said, if you want to join in transcription either on your own or as part of a group, uh, we do periodic transcribathons. That's one of the things that the lockdown period has, has led us to, uh, which is bring together teams of people from around the world. Uh, the next one coming up is this week. Uh, we've already got all of our transcribers. Uh, but we're going to be transcribing a, a bestiary live with, uh, with news being posted on Twitter on a daily basis, all as part of the Medieval Academy of America meeting. And um, you're welcome to follow along on Twitter or live on from the page, or if you want to set up something for yourself, you can set up your own transcription as well. Okay, so I wanted to leave some time for, for chatting and discussion, and I hope that that timing was about right. How are we doing? We're doing well, Julia. Do you want to watch for questions here? Sure will. William, Bill, William, uh, you are muted. Let's... A simple one. Uh, in one of your early slides, you, you talked about looking at a detail inside of a painted first initial as a guide. Play that out a bit for me. I didn't, I don't understand what that means. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, in order to have a, a decorated initial, there needed to be instructions uh, for, where's that? Uh, there needed to be instructions for the artist to know which initial they were going to be uh, painting. Mm -hmm. So what they would do is print a book like this, and then somebody would go through and write in, in very small letters, the letter that it was supposed to be. In this case, it looks just like a squiggle, uh, but that's an M right there. 
And then the artist comes by a little bit later and paints this beautiful M oh. uh, based on the guide there. And there are some hilarious mistakes that show up occasionally if somebody can't read the guide letter well and get the, the large decorated initial completely wrong. But in this case, they got the M perfectly right. And, and there was no attempt to paint over it. Uh, no, actually, um, for a number of like presentation manuscripts, you can see that people go by and scratch it out. But quite frequently, what we see is this this guide letter just left in there as if it as if it wasn't really noticeable. Sometimes painted over. Yeah, thank you. Other questions? <laughs> yeah, William. Yeah, um, most of the Mapa Mundi that I've seen have Jerusalem at the top, and uh, this one didn't. And it, the obvious question is why? Yeah, um, so. The reason why is because um, in that particular map and in that particular text, Jerusalem is set up as the center of the world and paradise is the highest uh, region that you can attain. So you're heading as far as you can to get to paradise, but most of, most people just stop off at Jerusalem on the way. Um, so there, there are a number of particularly 12th century um, Mapamundi that have paradise up at the top like that. Okay. Linda Jack? Yes, I'm very curious. I don't know why I'm green up there on the screen, but nevertheless, I'm curious what was in the flasks. What was in the flask? That was um, oil. Uh, so they were oil for oil lamps. And uh, I see John has popped up and is, hi John. Yeah. Um, I don't think we've tested the flasks to verify that they had oil in them, but I believe that that's how they were set up. Um, to be to be handled. Thank you. Bob Scott. Yeah, uh, Ben, uh, uh, I'm uh, beyond impressed with uh, your command of knowledge about the details of these books. And can you uh, say a few words about the kind of training you had to have in order to be able to function in the role that you now function in? Uh, th thanks, Bob. That's a, it's a tough question to answer. So um, I trained as a musicologist and was interested in manuscripts, but didn't know that much about them. And when I was at the University of Washington doing my PhD, I didn't have many opportunities to look at medieval manuscripts. And I just got extraordinarily lucky uh, in that I got a fellowship to go to Cambridge and while there hired on to work in the Parker Library. And part of that job was to just go through 530 manuscripts page by page in person, helping to get them cataloged and getting the metadata set up uh, for the Parker on the Web project. And I'd had paleography classes. I'd had history of the book classes. None of those made anywhere near as much of a mark as just sitting down with the books and looking at them. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I came over here to, to Stanford, um, I had the opportunity to work with John Mustaine regularly, and we would just look at books together and, and pick out interesting details and try to learn more about where they came from. And so I've got formal training in this area, but I would say I've learned the most by just sitting down with the books and, and playing with them. Mm -hmm. uh, and John may feel the same way about this particular particular job because we're, we're required to know something about a wide range of books. And the, the only way I've been able to do that is to learn from people who are working with the books and get in front of the books themselves, mm -hmm. which is, of course, why we invite you to come and visit anytime you want uh, to look at any of the books that are here. John, have you anything to add to that? Unmute. 
Uh, yes. Thank you. I, I would just say that Stanford's very lucky to have Ben, and I enjoyed working with him so very much, and I think he's right. It's just sitting down with the real objects, going over it page by page, and and being open to learning, and it's it's a wonderful world. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's very interesting. Yeah. Questions or comments? Uh, more of a comment, Ben. Uh, I just want to say I really like the way you linked all of those uh, pages together. That was a spectacular uh, use of the medium. So uh, if this is your idea of not doing it very well, I, I'm really looking forward <laughs> to when you do it well. <laughs> I, I wish there was an easier way to move between different applications in Zoom. Uh, that jumping out of sharing screen is is jarring to me. But um, there's some wonderful tools and uh, and we make them available. So if if you're ever playing around with these things, um, happy to give tutorials on particularly the IIIF software that I was using. Yeah, yeah, very nice result. Thank you. Thank you. William, do you have another question or is it an old hand? I do, but um, I think somebody else is up. But my question was um, for that 15th century trip, what would have been the time elapse between Venice and back again? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, okay, so they, they hang out in Venice for three weeks and then they move through Venetian territories along the north part of the Mediterranean. A couple days uh, between ports, it seems like. Um, the details aren't exactly clear to me. Um, but it, it's roughly a couple days between ports and they hit a number of ports as they move through the Venetian territories. So roughly three weeks between Venice to Jerusalem, something like that. Uh, and it seems like it's the Jerusalem, Bethlehem shift over to North Africa, trip up the Nile and then back across the Mediterranean that takes the, the bulk of the, the trip. Um, once they get to Jerusalem, the trip to Jerusalem is sort of the, the faster part. Uh, and then as they're moving overland, um, it seems to take a fair bit longer. Thank you. William? William, do you have a question? Uh, yes, I do. The, the, the date of that trip again was 1438? 1483, 1484. Well, this um, is after, huh? after uh, Constantinople became Istanbul. So there are a, a lot of Ottoman warships out there, and that was not safe territory. Not at all. I, I think that's the reason that they're sticking so closely to the Venetian ports as they move, uh, and and really hugging the coast as they go go around the Mediterranean. And, and I assume all parties made it home alive. <laughs> as far as I know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. Thank you. Ben, what were the, the flasks made out of? Uh, those are, um, uh, John, you may know this better. They're, they're a ceramic. I'm not sure exactly what the ceramic base is. It's a, a, a local Egyptian ceramic. <laughs> okay, that's why I wondered if you could have oil and something like that that would stay. So, Yeah, we, we could possibly get them, them analyzed. I don't think anybody's asked to do that but all we need is one clever researcher to ask the question and we can send them off to for analysis and do with your hands the diameter right you were talking in centimeters and uh, so yeah i thought they were pretty small about like that yeah yeah um what it's about three inches tall roughly you said four centimeters that added up to two point something yeah 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 that's pretty, pretty tough ceramics. Yes. Yeah. You'd have to glaze the inside so the oil doesn't pour through uh, unglazed. I expect that's right. I, I definitely do not know much about these pieces. John, do you have a, a recollection of anything from the dealer? I don't. I don't, Ben. Sorry. Uh, the suggestion was holy oil or oil for pilgrimage that would stay in the flask, but it may have been used so quickly that they didn't lose much out of it, so. I have another question. Bob Scott. Uh, uh, ben, 
a few sessions ago, we had a talk by Elaine Trehorn, and uh, she was talking about the difference between the experience of reading a book, a, an ancient manuscript in its original form and a digitized version and made the argument that those are really two quite different experiences. I wonder if you have any observations to make about that or what your own experience is in that regard. Yeah, Elena and I talk about this a lot and, and I agree with her completely. It is, it's a physically different experience. It's a mentally different experience. Uh, one of the ways that I've been thinking about it, because I grew up in the microfilm age, uh, is that digitized images are really just a little bit better version of microfilm. They, yeah. they're, they're done to extract text. In this case, we get color and, and some detail as well, mm -hmm. but it's still just a subset of the information contained in the manuscript. You don't get the, the feel of the vellum or paper, the weight of it. Uh, you don't get to, to smell the book. Um, you don't really get a sense of how the weight of the book changes as you move through it, uh, or see the juxtapositions that happen um, across pages in many cases uh, when you're reading them. So it's it's a very different sort of thing, and it, it really is sort of an extraction of a subset of information for, in many yeah. cases, specific scholarly yeah. purposes. Yeah. Dick Jones? Okay, I was... Uh, interested in the fact that you're doing transcriptions but not translations and you know I, they're not accessible to me as a transcription uh, I, I would like to mention that there is a book of, of translations of the Oxyrhynchus papyri I think it's a Dover book but I had read that uh, some time ago and it's quite interesting if you can find it Thanks for that. Yeah, no, that's that's a really good point, um, and particularly for things like papyri, where it, it's so hard to read, um, but the language as well. Um, so for that software that I was showing you that we've had the students using, step one is to transcribe it so that they're used to the hand, but you can also set it up then for translation. And unfortunately, the classes this year have been compressed. So we've gotten through the transcription, but never gotten to the translation. But that is the next step. And yes, that, you're absolutely right. That would make it much more accessible to everybody. Anybody else I'm not seeing? Speak up. Can, can you look at a page of that? I assume it's Latin and actually read it, you as an individual, or? Yeah, if you had asked about medieval French, I would have said yes. Medieval Latin, I can look at it, I can get the words, and then I sit down with the dictionary and try to work my way okay. through it. Yeah. There is no Google Translate. There is a Google Translate, and it sort of works. Um, and you can paste things in and get a, a gist, yeah. I think our classics professors would probably not be happy with me for saying that, but that, that is a good way to get started for sure. Other questions and thoughts? Thank you, back to you, Evelyn. Um, did Dick have another question? I forgot to thank, <laughs> I forgot to thank Ben. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Ben. Oh, well, thank you all. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was fun. I just wish we could have you here in person. It's yeah. it's a lot more fun than we can explore. Yeah. I wish you could hear the applause. <laughs> <laughs> we really appreciate you doing this for us. Yeah, a fascinating My, journey for all of us. My who pleasure. Can barely go past our mailboxes yet to this day. <laughs> so <laughs> it was sweet of you to do it. It's nice to have John with us. Yeah, you're coming, John. Yeah. And this has been a lovely evening, getting to have the special collections experience one way or the other. So thank you for doing that for us. I will send everybody the information about Jackie Young's talk. And Ben's going to send us uh, the links to, to all the online things that we can access. 
And with Jackie Young's, I'll send you the name of her book so you can order it now and have it all read before she starts her talk. <laughs> Lovely. All right. Yeah. Great. So thank you so much. You. Wonderful. That was a wonderful. Yeah. Appreciate it. So. Bye. Thank you all. And Next month. Yeah. We'll see you in the reading room soon, I hope. <laughs> Bye. -bye. <Okay. laughs>